Hi everyone and welcome back to History Calling where I bring you new videos every Friday on all aspects of history. Today is the second video looking at the life of Henry VII and also the second entry in my Tudor Monarch series. We'll be picking up where we left off in the last video just after the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 when Henry Tudor, formerly the Earl of Richmond, defeated Richard III, becoming the man who won the Wars of the Roses and the first Tudor King of England. Some might say that after 14 years in exile and on the run from Edward IV and King Richard, the worst was behind him, but Henry now found himself a king under threat. This is a story of rebellions, pretenders to the crown, and a man who was never truly safe or at peace, but who was one of history's great survivors. Stick around to learn how he and his new queen, Elizabeth of York, dealt with the problems they encountered, and to get an early glimpse of their second son, the now infamous Henry VIII, who I'll be looking at in much more detail next week. If you like the Tudors, you should also check out my series on the Six Wives of Henry VIII, which I'll leave linked on screen and in the description box. I'll also pop some links for books, movies, TV shows and documentaries down there in case you'd like to learn more about Henry VII or the Wars of the Roses. And now, let's see how the reign of the Tudors began. It's the 22nd of August 1485 and Henry Tudor has just won the Battle of Bosworth and been crowned King of England on the battlefield to the sound of acclamations from his soldiers and with the circlet which, until a matter of minutes ago, belonged to his newly deceased rival and predecessor Richard III. The Plantagenet era is over and the Tudor era has begun, but no one knows quite what to expect from the new king. He has never lived in England and prior to 1485 had perhaps only visited it once as a young teenager. He has no experience as a ruler or even a great landowner, having been stripped of his inheritance as a child, and few people in the country even know him. Establishing his authority and his dynasty will be an uphill struggle. In the weeks and months after the battle, Henry began to build his new regime. He arrived in London on the 3rd of September and soon rewarded his most loyal followers. Most notably, his paternal uncle, Jasper Tudor, who had spent the past 14 years in exile on the continent with him, was made the Duke of Bedford. His stepfather, Thomas Stanley, who intervened in the later stages of the Battle of Bosworth with his brother, Sir William Stanley, helping Henry to secure a victory, was made the Earl of Derby. Sir William became Chamberlain of the Household. Henry's mother, the formidable Lady Margaret Beaufort, sometimes known as the Red Queen, thanks to the book series by Philippa Gregory, links in the description box, had all her lands restored to her, having lost them in her fight to help Henry take the throne. She became known by the title of My Lady the King's Mother and was a dowager queen in all but name, remaining a powerful figure throughout the rest of his reign. Henry also appointed a large number of experienced administrators to help him run his new country, including many who had come with him from France. The King's formal coronation, an expensive and glittering affair, took place on the 30th of October in Westminster Abbey. Decades later, the chronicler Edward Hall would describe it thus. He, with great pomp, was conveyed to Westminster, and there, the 30 day of October, was, with all ceremonies accustomed, anointed and crowned King by the whole ascent as well of the Commons as of the nobility, and was named King Henry VII of that name which kingdom he obtained and enjoyed as a thing by God elected and provided, and by his special favour and gracious aspect compassed and achieved. One report states that it was also on this day that he was reunited with his mother Margaret for the first time since the age of 14, and that she wept marvellously to see her son crowned King of England, something she had fought almost as hard for as he had. Despite his new position, however, or perhaps because of it, Henry didn't feel safe, and he had already created a personal bodyguard for himself and his successors, the Yeoman of the Guard. The coronation was followed a week later by his first Parliament, which opened on the 7th of November. It was during this that Henry did something rather sneaky. He had the first day of his reign entered into the records as being the 21st of August, the day before the Battle of Bosworth. This made everyone who had shown up for Richard that day a traitor and gave him a pretext to seize their lands and money. Henry was prioritising strength over popularity, and nothing could now make him stronger than making an appropriate marriage and producing an heir. As it stood, the royal family at this point consisted of just one person, Henry himself. 
His closest blood relations were his mother and uncle Jasper, but they weren't royal. There was a pre-existing royal family, however, the Yorks. For generations they had been the rival claimants to the throne against Henry's Lancastrian line, but now it was time to make an alliance. As you may know from my last video, Henry had sworn on Christmas Day 1483 to marry the now 19-year-old Princess Elizabeth of York, eldest daughter of King Edward IV and Queen Elizabeth Woodville, aka the White Queen, and during his first Parliament the MPs formally asked him to do so. There were a number of obstacles to overcome before this plan could be enacted, however. Elizabeth's uncle, Richard III, had declared her to be illegitimate and this had to be reversed by Parliament. As the two were distant cousins, a papal dispensation also had to be sought to allow the marriage to proceed. Some have wondered if Henry deliberately delayed the wedding in order to establish his sole right to the crown, rather than having anyone say that he held it in right of his wife, whose royal pedigree was much more impressive than his, and who might well have inherited the crown herself had she been born a couple of generations later. His biographer, S.B. Crimes, the book is linked below, is scathing of this idea though, citing the obstacles I just mentioned, explaining that Henry was too busy during the first months of his reign to get married, and noting that he probably wanted to meet and get to know Elizabeth before they were wed. He concludes that actually, all things considered, matters moved pretty quickly. The wedding took place on the 18th of January, 1486, though the final paperwork for the dispensation didn't come through until early March. Afterwards, Henry would create one of the most recognisable symbols of all time. By combining the white rose, which represented his wife's House of York, with the red rose, which represented his own Lancastrian ancestry, Henry made the Tudor rose, an image you can still see all over royal buildings to this day. The new dynasty was further strengthened by the birth of the couple's first son, Prince Arthur, who was named after the mythical King of Britain and who arrived at Winchester on the 19th of September, just eight months after their marriage. You can make of this timing what you will. Arthur may have been premature or his parents may have slept together before their wedding ceremony. If Elizabeth was pregnant at the time of the marriage, it's important to understand this in the context of the times. The two were pre-contracted to be wed, and in the 15th century this was almost as good as a marriage itself. Indeed, sleeping together after being engaged would have been enough to make the marriage valid, and the later ceremony more of a formality. I do wonder if they wed before the final papal dispensation had come through because they realised that Elizabeth was expecting and wanted to have their marriage formally recognised, but this is just supposition on my part. Arthur would be followed by many other siblings, but only three survived infancy. These were Princess Margaret, born on the 28th of November 1489 and later Queen of Scotland and grandmother of Mary Queen of Scots. Then there was Prince Henry, Duke of York, the future Henry VIII, who was born on the 28th of June 1491. And finally, Princess Mary, future Queen of France and Duchess of Suffolk and grandmother of Lady Jane Grey. She came into the world on the 18th of March 1496. From a familial point of view, the dynasty seemed increasingly secure, but Henry had other, much more serious problems to contend with. There were rebellions in the north of England as early as Easter 1486, but these fizzled out fast. The main threats Henry would face to his throne came from his new in-laws, the Yorks, and from people pretending to be them. The most senior surviving male of the House of York was Elizabeth of York's cousin, Edward Earl of Warwick, who was the son of George, Duke of Clarence, a brother of Edward IV and Richard III. Henry had taken the precaution of having the boy put in the Tower of London as soon as he came to the throne, but this didn't stop Edward from becoming a figurehead for rebellion, particularly as rumours were circulated of his escape. In February 1487, a ten-year-old known to history as Lambert Simnel, not his real name by the way, which may have been John, showed up in Ireland and was presented as Warwick. Henry countered by parading the real Earl, actually age 12 at that point, through the streets of London and arresting and eventually imprisoning Robert Stillington, Bishop of Bath and Wells, who was suspected of involvement in the plot. There's also a theory that his mother-in-law, Queen Elizabeth Woodville, was implicated. This is because her jointure lands were revoked and transferred to her daughter Elizabeth, and she herself repaired to Bermondsey Abbey in February 1487, where she died in 1492. As S.B. Crimes has pointed out, however, there is no evidence that the two events were related, and Elizabeth may well have opted to retire in this way, with the timing no more than a coincidence. Whatever the case, the Simnel situation got worse before it got better. 
The Irish nobility, though well aware that Lambert was not Warwick, were keen to depose Henry for their own ends, and so supported the boy's claims. Soon another of Elizabeth of York's cousins, John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, whose mother was a sister of Edward IV and Richard III, slipped through Henry's fingers and fled to the Netherlands, where he enlisted the support of his maternal aunt, Margaret of York, Duchess of Burgundy, yet another sibling of Edward and Richard. The Yorks were a big family. Lincoln landed in Ireland with an invasion force on the 5th of May in support of his fake cousin. Then, even though it was patently obvious that Lambert was a fraud and a puppet being used by others for their own ends, he was recognised as King Edward VI and crowned here in Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin on the 24th of May. Lincoln and his forces then set out for England, where he landed on the 4th of June before engaging Henry's forces at Stoke on the 16th. Henry's army was triumphant. Lincoln was killed and Lambert was captured. Henry showed mercy to the child, however, and gave him a job as a kitchen boy in the royal household, later making him a falconer. His final fate is unknown, but he was still alive in 1534. Thus, Henry had survived the first major rebellion of his reign. There were other causes for celebration too, for soon after, on the 24th of November, 1487, Elizabeth of York's coronation finally occurred. The Yorkist threat was still far from over, however, and four years later a new, even more serious challenger to the crown emerged. In 1491, a man by the name of Perkin Warbeck appeared in Cork, Ireland, claiming to be Richard Duke of York, one of the princes in the Tower and Henry's brother-in-law. Unlike when Lambert Simnel had pretended to be the Earl of Warwick, Henry was unable to prove that the young Richard was definitely dead, and Warbeck managed, albeit temporarily, to gain the support of Charles VIII of France, a man who had once sheltered Henry and helped him to gain his throne. And if you'd like to know more about that, see my previous video on Henry's life before he was king. Henry invaded France, laying siege to Boulogne, and ultimately made a treaty with Charles which forbade the latter from assisting any of Henry's enemies. Perkin now changed tack and turned to Henry's pesky aunt-in-law, Margaret of York, Duchess of Burgundy, who supported him just as she had done the Earl of Lincoln and Lambert Simnel. Margaret declared that she recognised Perkin as her nephew Richard, a person she could not have seen since 1480 at the latest and who would have been a child of seven at that time. By 1493, Warbeck had been recognised as the rightful King of England by Maximilian, King of the Romans, and when Henry initiated investigations within his own household to establish if anyone there was supporting the pretender, he discovered that the betrayal hit very close to home indeed, within his own extended family in fact. His step-uncle, the wealthy Sir William Stanley, the man who had helped him defeat Richard III at Bosworth, again see my previous video, and who Henry had made Chamberlain of his household, was discovered to be neck deep in the conspiracy. He was tried, found guilty of treason, and executed on the 16th of February, 1495. The King's family shrank further that November when his uncle Jasper, Duke of Bedford, also died. Before this, though, on the 3rd of July, some of Warbeck's forces landed at Deal in an attempt to oust Henry. It was a disaster. There was little to no local support for them, and they were captured and killed. Warbeck himself fled back to Ireland, then to Scotland, where he was well received by King James IV, who went so far as to marry him off to his own kinswoman, Catherine Gordon, indicating that he believed Warbeck truly was Richard, Duke of York. Henry needed to deal with this escalating situation, which had now been rumbling on for four years and which was interfering with his plans to marry his son Arthur to the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon, whose parents would not agree to the marriage while there was still such a serious pretender to the Tudor throne. He opened negotiations with Scotland to have the young James IV marry his own daughter, Princess Margaret, and when Warbeck made a pathetic attempt to invade England as King Richard IV in September 1496, it was a complete failure which sent him running back to Scotland. The following year, James sent Warbeck to Ireland, where he obtained no support. Then he attempted to rally supporters to his cause in England, where he landed in Cornwall in September 1497. Though a few thousand joined him, he was defeated by Henry's forces in barely two weeks and captured. He then finally confessed to his real identity. Henry treated him leniently to begin with, allowing him to stay at court. However, Warbeck, who doesn't seem to have been the brightest spark in the fire, abused this good treatment by attempting to run in 1498. He was recaptured, brought back to London, forced to publicly confess his real identity again, and twice put in the stocks. 
he was then locked up in the Tower of London, where he concocted a scheme with Edward, Earl of Warwick, to escape once again. This was the final straw for Henry. Warbeck was found guilty of trying to escape and hanged on the 21st of November, 1499. It was the end of the line for Warwick too. The 24-year-old was executed for treason on Tower Hill on the 24th of November that same year. For a brief moment, all seemed well for the king. The most significant threats to the Tudor dynasty had been dealt with, and Henry's foreign policy and plans for his children could move forward. Arthur was married to Catherine of Aragon by proxy in 1499, and Princess Margaret was engaged to the King of Scotland. As ever in Henry's life, though, the good times weren't to last. The beautiful, intelligent, and spectacularly well-connected Catherine of Aragon landed in England in October 1501, where she was married to Prince Arthur in a magnificent ceremony in London on the 14th of November. It was one of the high points of Henry's reign, helping to make him and England much more prominent players on the international stage. Incidentally, you might want to check out my video looking at whether or not Arthur and Catherine consummated this marriage, as this question would turn out to be of critical importance during the reign of Catherine's second husband, Arthur's brother Henry VIII, when he used their prior relationship as brother and sister-in-law to petition for an annulment of their marriage in order to marry Anne Boleyn. In 1501, however, this was all decades in the future, and the Prince and Princess of Wales soon moved to the Principality and set up home in Ludlow Castle. Then, just four and a half months after the wedding, disaster struck. The 15-year-old Arthur fell ill and died on the 2nd of April, 1502. When the news was brought to his parents at Greenwich Palace three days later, their grief was profound. Henry was awoken by his confessor and told what had happened, then sent for his wife. The scene between them then unfolded as follows. After that she was come, and saw the king her lord, and that natural and painful sorrow, as I have heard say, she with full great and constant comfortable words besought his grace, that he would first after God remember the well of his own noble person, the comfort of his realm, and of her. She then said that my lady his mother had never no more children but him only, and that God by his grace had ever preserved him, and brought him where he was. Over that, how that God had left him yet a fair prince, two fair princesses, and that God is where he, meaning Arthur, was, and we are both young enough, and she means there that they're young enough to have children, and that the prudence and wisdom of his grace sprung all over Christendom, so that it should please him to take this accordingly thereunto. Then the king thanked her of her good comfort. After that she departed and came to her own chamber, Natural and motherly remembrance of that great loss smote her so sorrowful to the heart that those about her were fain to send for the king to comfort her. Then his grace of true, gentle, and faithful love in good haste came and relieved her, and showed her how wise counsel she had given him before. And he for his part would thank God for his son, and would she should do in likewise. Elizabeth's point that they were both still young enough to have more children was of crucial importance, for no woman had ever successfully succeeded to the throne, and the entire Tudor dynasty now hung on the life of the ten-year-old Prince Henry. His parents needed another boy to be on the safe side. Within weeks Elizabeth was pregnant once more, but instead of lessening their problems it only led to additional tragedy. She gave birth on the 2nd of February, 1503, but the baby was a girl, Catherine, and she died soon afterwards. Worse still, nine days after the birth, on the 11th of February, Elizabeth too died of childbed fever. It was her 37th birthday. Henry was beside himself with grief. Despite the circumstances of their marriage and their messy family life, which included him occasionally having to imprison or kill some of his in-laws, Theirs had been a happy union, and he seems to have genuinely loved her and she him. Furthermore, there is no record of him ever taking a mistress, a rare occurrence amongst English kings. Now, though, she was dead, as were five of the eight children she had borne him. Henry's family, his dynasty, and everything he'd fought so hard for his entire life seemed to be unravelling. He shut himself up in his rooms for a time, or as a contemporary source put it, privily departed to a solitary place and would no man should resort unto him. He also temporarily cast off the reputation he had acquired for miserliness to provide a spectacular funeral and burial for Elizabeth at Westminster Abbey. When he emerged from his confinement, he began the task of trying to shore up and protect what remained of his children and his legacy. 
To preserve the Spanish alliance, his daughter-in-law Catherine had been quickly rebetrothed to Prince Henry in mid-1502, though her father-in-law would keep her in relative poverty for a princess while he negotiated a new settlement with her parents, and in the end she would not marry her prince until after Henry VIII's accession. As for young Prince Henry himself, he was created Duke of Cornwall in late 1502, then Prince of Wales in 1503, and was essentially wrapped up in cotton wool by his father and kept mostly out of the public eye, lest anything should happen to him too. The marriage of 13-year-old Princess Margaret to James IV of Scotland also went ahead, and she departed England in the summer of 1503, just a few months after her mother and baby sister had died. Henry himself was now also available for remarriage, and though he never did take another wife, there were negotiations with a number of European countries for a prospective bride, and even talk of him marrying Catherine of Aragon himself. There were still Yorkist threats to the throne which remained to be tied up to. Edmund de la Pole, Earl of Suffolk, was yet another of Elizabeth of York's cousins, and a son of her paternal aunt, also, confusingly, called Elizabeth of York. Until the early 1500s, he had fared well in Henry's reign, having been too young to be caught up in the treasonous activities of his older brother, John Earl of Lincoln. Relations soured with Henry over financial and legal matters, however, including Suffolk's prosecution for murder. He fled into exile in 1500, and though persuaded to return on that occasion, he and his brother Richard de la Pole left again in August 1501, whereupon Suffolk attempted to arrange an invasion of England to take the crown from Henry. These plans came to nothing. By autumn 1505, he had been imprisoned by Philip von Liechtenstein at Namur, and in January 1506, he was seeking to negotiate with Henry for a safe return to England. That same month, King Philip of Castile and his wife Joanna, a sister of Catherine of Aragon, were washed up on English shores, and Henry was able to take advantage of the situation to ensure that Edmund was delivered back to him in April, before Philip left England. Again, though, I would have to say that I think he showed a surprising, even impressive degree of mercy, considering the time period he was living in and the crimes Suffolk had committed. Rather than killing the Earl, Henry had him imprisoned in the Tower, where, by the by, he was also holding one of the other de la Pole brothers, William, thus neutralising two additional threats to his throne. Suffolk was eventually executed in 1513 by Henry VIII, but only after his brother Richard had had himself declared King of England by Louis XIII of France, and Henry VIII felt it was best to eliminate another potential Yorkist threat. By the turn of the 16th century, Henry VII was also unpopular for his heavy financial demands upon his subjects, and gained a reputation for being rapacious, using extortionately high bonds and enforced debts to keep subjects in line, and personally checking his accounts, making notes on them in his own hand. The man who had grown up with nothing, having had all his possessions taken from him, seems to have been determined that he would never be poor again, and his income from the royal estates, customs duties and taxation soared. He was now approaching the end of his life, however. His health had been failing since 1502, and his increasingly poor eyesight made writing difficult. His hair had turned white, and the few teeth he had left were black with decay. His final decline from an unknown illness began in 1509, and he died at Richmond Palace, which he had built and named after his earldom, on Saturday the 21st of April at 11pm. He was buried on the 11th of May next to his wife in his chapel in Westminster Abbey, their tomb topped by two magnificent statues of the deceased king and queen, young and beautiful, and lying together in endless repose. His mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, survived him by only two months, dying herself on the 29th of June. Now it was the next generation's turn to try their hand at ruling. Henry left behind him a country which was far more stable than when he had claimed it in 1485, and his 17-year-old son, Prince Henry, was the first monarch to succeed his father to the throne unopposed since 1422. Remember to ensure you're subscribed with notifications switched on so that you don't miss my next video, which will look at the childhood and early reign of this ultimate Tudor bad boy. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Let me know too in the comments what you think of Henry VII. Do you see him as a good person and king doing the best he could in a kill or be killed world, or a grasping usurper who got lucky and found himself on a throne he should never have held? As always, I look forward to reading your comments. Until next time, keep learning.